Hallelujah. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. We worship you, Lord. Glory be to God. We bless your holy and righteous name. And we welcome your presence in this place, God. Oh, we welcome you. And all the people in 1130 service said, Amen. Hey, wow. that's not bad. A fire bunch out there. They sound a little Pentecostal. You, how many of you sound Pentecostal? Well, a shouting group. The nine o'clock service, man, they were like way up here. But I'm going to tell you though, part of it is they had like two weeks to practice because we were on vacation. <laughs> so they all they all did good. But we had a great vacation. You know, one thing I loved about it didn't have to set an alarm. And uh, how many of you like that? You don't have to set an alarm. You just kind of yeah, wake up. Yeah, but we still got up early sometimes a lot. Yeah, we I don't did. know. Do, your That's my body, body clock. clock. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But. One of the things we had on our vacation is, Brenda, your father got He graduated, graduated in heaven, glory, and so, we're happy for so him. That was really cool. And uh, it was amazing because we had the graveside service here at the Omaha National Cemetery to honor your dad's For military honors. All my dad was 24 years Air Force, and so we were yeah. proud of him. Yeah, proud of him. You know, I never, I mean, I've done a lot of homegoing services, but I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever seen a graveside service like that, where they brought that kind of honor to a patriot, but also to America. It was it was just amazing. So, but we're glad to be back. One thing that we did get a chance to do is, of course, the family came in. That's why we were not able to uh, be with you all on Friday. But I heard it was a great time, and thank you all of those who put that together the Friday night yeah, I summer I saw the bash. pictures online. You guys like looked like you had a blast. It was amazing. <laughs> and we'll get to the next one or so. But anyway, thank you for making that happen. But uh, we kind of had a friendly little game of, uh, how many remember playing around the world basketball? Remember that with basketball? A friendly game? It was a friendly game. How many of you remember around the world where you go around? And uh, so- There were some competitive families. How many here, of you are competitive? Tell. Yes. When, when Jonathan and Matt, when we get together, it's never friendly. We pound each other. But uh, anyway, so we had a friendly game. Jonathan, I know you're watching, but uh, you want to tell us, Matthew, what happened? Yeah, well, first off, sure. I just want to shout out Grandpa. I'm wearing his actual tie, this Green Bay Packer tie. Yeah. And uh, just want to honor him today. So. But you got your feistiness from your grandpa. Because if you've ever I saw did. him watch Green Bay. Mm, wow. Yeah, we got a little feisty. It wasn't, it's not good sometimes. <laughs> um, we'll just leave it at that. So uh, you think it, Pentecostal church in the living room. So, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, so we had a fun, friendly game, friendly game. Uh, of around the world, which is you shoot, uh, you get like 12 shots around the driveway and whoever can make it around the course first wins the game. So I'm at like the second to last shot. Johnny's around the second to last shot. Pastor Hank is at the second shot and third shot and not losing. being able to make anything. So losing. all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and you guys are gonna go on crazy. Purpose. Uh, on purpose, yeah, yeah right. Purpose. So Pastor Brenda was grilling some steaks she comes outside. Now, Pastor Brenda, Pastor Hank, they were great high school athletes. Okay, you played football. You were a basketball I player. Say great. You were an MVP, though. So well, come on now. Yeah. Give yourself some credit now. So she comes, up, yeah. she comes outside, and all of a sudden, Pastor Hank sees you come outside, and he gets like this Michael Jordan look in his eyes. Okay, you think he was getting ready that to guy, prophesy on, like the, on the driveway Jordan. basketball court, okay? So Johnny and I look at each other. He looks at us and goes, oh, my bride's out here. Watch this. And he goes and absolutely nets the next like six or seven shots, gets around the driveway, passes Jonathan and myself, who are the second to last shot, because the way we play is you get two shots. And on the third one, you can either chance it. If you miss, you go back to the beginning, or you can just wait until it's your next turn. He doesn't let us get another shot. He just keeps netting, all net, wet, butter. Gets to the last shot, which is all the way by the porch, which is about a 35, 40 foot shot. I mean, it's half court shot easily. I didn't know you could throw it that far. Honey. And this guy, <laughs> this <impressive>. guy <laughs> gives us one look and Jonathan and I are like, all right, he's stuck here. There's no way he is draining this. He looks at us and absolutely just gives us the most ornery look. Like, I know it's going in, and he goes, angels, and it nets. Matt, now you know how a lot of people, they'll, they'll shoot a basket in a trash can, and they'll go, Kobe. And they'll say, you know, Kobe, or something like that. He angels. goes, angels, 
and drills it. That's because no got, rim, no nothing. All you heard was butter. But you got to learn how to release the host. But here's the thing. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. But how many of you remember Michael Jordan? He was my favorite basketball player. They called him Air Jordan. You know, they didn't realize I'm Air Hank. Because after I got done playing, I was like, <sighs> <laughs> never mind. No. Anyway, I like to do this. I like to greet those of you that are also watching around the world, also in the chapel. We're so honored that you came and joined us for this service and uh got a great word in our mouth we're talking about pentecost anything you want I'm to say i'm telling about you that? the nine o'clock we had to bring contractors in to repaint the place okay. i believe <laughs> you are, seriously but i believe you are in for a treat today yeah. the holy ghost fire was in this room Amen. and i believe it's going to be in this service how many Amen. of you agree Amen. with that come on don't be dry don't be don't be like a telephone Amen. pole pull on heaven today come on somebody let's believe god that his miracle power is going to be in this place Come on, throw those hands up to heaven. Say it, say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit you're here. You're here. I'm full, I'm full of, power. of power. Pentecostal fire is in my bones. Now I want you to shout like you really believe it. Come on, let's praise him today. Hallelujah. sense right now that something is happening. Can you imagine what the sound must have been like when millions of Jews were walking in a place called Jericho. I wonder what the people of Jericho thought as they looked out their windows and there's dust filling the air but there's a sound and it wasn't just the sound of the people's feet it was the sound of the agreement of walking with heaven because God said there were barriers, there were walls, there was and is an enemy that thinks it's impenetrable. And this describes what is happening in our nation right now. They have raised their fists against God. They have pushed God out. They have pushed their evil agenda and it looks impenetrable. Some think that the walls that they have raised with their narratives and their lies will never be broken or undone. But there is a sound. And it's the movement of the spirit of the living God and it's moving the remnant. Now listen to me. Some say, but America needs to repent. Listen to me. Are you the judge of the earth? Why not be like Moses who stood up in the face of God when God said, leave me alone, Moses. I will wipe their name out from my remembrance and I will start over with you. And Moses said, no, God. No, God, you will remember your covenant. And one man changed the destiny of a nation. But listen to me. Throughout history, when Israel was failing, when the nation was backslidden, was it the majority of the nation that turned the hand of God to remember His covenant and to act on behalf of the nation? No, it was always a remnant. A small group of people that often is overlooked, a remnant, a throwaway, a castaway, insignificant, made fun of, rejected.
throughout the history of Israel, God used the small, the few, to save a nation. And I'm here to tell you there is something that the remnant has been doing. They have been marching along inside and with God saying they stole our election. They are trying to steal our freedoms. They have put a puppet show and a narrative, God, that they're trying to shove down our throats. They raised up a scandemic, a pandemic, and they're trying to take away our freedoms. And God, we will not have any of it. And the Lord says, just keep marching, keep marching, keep marching, keep marching, keep marching, because he needs the responsibility. He needs the cooperation of the remnant. Come on. That something is about to shift and turn, and it is. It's in process. It's the tearing down of their walls. It's the tearing down of their agenda. And is there a spiritual Jericho? There is. Once again, these things that have been upon the earth and the nation, that the remnant walking in sync with heaven, who's in celebration mode, by the way. Heaven is not in fear. Heaven is celebrating. Because they know all of this. Yipanikijimarukumai is about to come down. Man, I felt that like a nuclear missile. That hit something right in the devil's backside. I felt it. Come on, some of you just need to move in place. Come on, you the remnant or you the complainer? You the remnant that says, hey, these giants are bred for us. Are you the remnant that says, I'm not going to complain. I see a nation, America, the home of the free, the home of the brave. It's going to flow with milk and honey. Come on. And the giants will fall. Ha! The walls will fall. The lies are going to come tumbling, 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 tumbling down. The false government is going to come tumbling, 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 tumbling down. Are you the remnant? Come on, do you have the spirit of Joshua? Do you have the spirit of Caleb upon you? That you see the promise of what God has said to this nation. Come on, if that's you, move your feet. And then on the count of seven, you're gonna, you're gonna shout. And you're gonna activate a release in the spirit realm that's gonna bring great damage to the devil. Come on. I'm part of the remnant. I'm gonna see my mountain at 80. You ready? When I tell you to shout after the count of seven, you shout in your living room, you shout in the chapel. Don't you stop shouting. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, shout!
say, God, because of me. Come on, because of my prayers. Because of my decrees. The walls are coming down. The lies are coming down. The deception is coming down. The evil is coming down. Come on, it's coming down, 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 down. Come on, God always looks at a remnant. Come on. God always cuts it short in righteousness, the scripture says, because of the remnant. Hallelujah. I felt that. How many of you felt that? See, I was on one time on a television show. And one of the speakers was on. And they said, America needs to repent. I don't doubt it. Dude, you need to repent too. We all do. We need to live a repentive life. And they were going on and on and on. America needs to repent. America needs to repent. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this guy. And I behaved myself. I shouldn't have. And I'm thinking, dude, you called for a national repentance several months before the election was stolen. Didn't you think that worked? Didn't you think you had any effect? Why is it that we allow people to self-impose upon us their numbers? Come on. We do the same thing Abraham did. Well, if we could just find 50 righteous in America, we'll get out of this mess. Excuse me. Don't you make a difference? Haven't we? No, no, here's the question. Boy, I feel it under the anointing. Not just don't you make a difference. How about this? Don't you think we've made a difference? Well, no, Pastor, because of all the evil. There had to be an evening sacrifice in the days of Elijah, there had to be darkness so that fire could fall. And when it did, all the media that were blabbing their mouths, the false prophets of Baal were cut off. And God's word and will stood in the land. This is what we're in, this is where we're heading. So you be part of the remnant. You be part of the remnant. You be part of the remnant. And the remnant's job is to be before God's face so that an awakening can come so that the people who need, who are sitting in darkness will start being awakened and get saved. Their hearts will begin to change. They'll become convicted by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So don't get up. Listen, there's such a religious spirit right now. And, and, and one of the religious spirit is, you know, we're just going to look at all the, the bad and fit it into Matthew 24. Which a lot of Matthew 24 already happened, by the way. It did. I'm not saying it. But how I many you know it also is going to happen again? And it is happening again. But why do they always ignore verse 14? It says, this gospel of good news, Matthew 24, 14, shall be preached as a witness or demonstrated. Then the end will come. No, they got to pull out Gog, Magog, Eggnog scriptures, put them all together. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some relevancy or truth. But God forbid if we are so in the last of the last of the end times that the Lord is going to pull us out of the earth right now on a rescue mission. That's not what the Bible says. That's why I don't believe it. Do I believe in His coming? Absolutely. Do I believe it now? No, I don't think it's going to be now. Because... He said he's coming for a glorious church. He's coming back, not on a rescue mission. He's coming back to show he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back for a church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Amen. Here's another one. There will be signs in the heavens and wonders in the earth. Or wonders in heaven, signs in the earth. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The, the sun will be darkened. The moon will turn blood red. And then they write their books. 
How come anybody didn't call them out? They wrote their books about the blood moon. Everybody was in the blood moon craze. Practically thought rather being Christians, we were moonies. And they made all these predictions. And they sold their books and made their money. But who's called them out? And, and, they, and they don't keep reading. And they say, oh yeah, but see it says before the dreadful day of the Lord, this will happen. The Bible actually translates that before the awesome day of the Lord. And then it goes on and says in Acts 2, the awesome day of the Lord. Do you believe that there's an awesome day of the Lord? Do you believe that God before he comes can bring an awesome day of the Lord? Where his glory begins to touch this planet. And, and then it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's talking about these signs in the heavens when the sun is darkened and the blood turned, uh, turns red. It's a sign that those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that means? A great and grand awakening of the Lord. A harvest. So pull your head out of the bunker. put your eyes on the redemptive plan of God let me ask you a question who's strong I don't know why I'm saying this I feel like God wants to adjust something over our nation because that's what I feel this word going forth is hitting something here's another one so who's stronger think about this before you answer who is stronger the beast the antichrist or the Holy Ghost really you think so church how come some of the churches don't act like it they're all scared of chips that they're getting ruffled <laughs> you didn't get that did you? <laughs> they're all afraid of the beast he could be here they're all trying to identify who the Antichrist is and yet did you ever read in your end time theology what is restraining the spirit of antichrist it says the holy spirit is the holy spirit still here yes he is then the beast and the antichrist cannot have any authority over me or to maneuver in the earth because the power of the lord's church yeah, the spirit-filled ones. You don't realize how strong you are when you pray in tongues. So I say that because I believe some things are coming down. And God is raising up his remnant, glorious church. How many believe that? Amen? Do you have anything, Mama? All right. Welcome to your message before the message. <laughs> Why don't you do this? Why don't you turn around? And find somebody that you don't know, share your name, and then say, I bet I know if you could live in any state in the United States, I bet I know which one it would be. Amen? And if you don't know the name of the states, just say Hawaii. All right? There you go. All right. Greet one another. smile at somebody on their way down all right well, this is one of our favorite parts of being a church family and really being a pastor and that is dedicating children back to the Lord so at this time if the parents and those that are dedicating their children to the Lord if you would be so kind to come forward I'd appreciate that ushers if you could help them if they could just Come forward with their child being dedicated or children. That will be wonderful. And they're all so cute. Brenda, look at this. We might be babysitting. Look at this, Brenda. <laughs> and some of the parents are like, please babysit, right? <laughs> so, oh, really? Where's the sign-up sheet? Listen, we have three German shepherds, and that's babysitting. 
So, yeah, I spent my vacation on, with water, you know, playing in the water with them. How many of you, do you have dogs? Do you have, anyone have dogs? They love to play in the water. They love to play in the water. If I say it, they go crazy. Hi, guys, how are you? Good to see you. All right. Bless you guys. They were down in the chapel. It was great seeing you also. All right, would you guys do me a favor? And I, I don't want to embarrass you, but your children are so cute. And so I would like for you all to turn around, let the world see how beautiful, what godly children look like, godly families look like, and uh, to the family. All right. Aren't they cute? They're adorable. Amen. All right. You could go ahead and turn back this way towards me. This is probably one of the highlights that I have. That's why I'm a, a children's book author and, and uh, creator is I love kids. I love children. And so does the father. And so this is a really important time in this child's life, but it's also important in the life of you, their parent and guardians, because you are saying before God that what he has given to you, you are now going to give back to him. And that you are standing before not only Almighty God, but you are standing before your family, your church family. You're standing really before the whole world when you turn to that camera. And you're saying, you know what? We will raise these children in the fear and the admonition of Almighty God. And that is an amazing, amazing stance, especially today when our children are being exploited. So much stuff is being thrown at our kids. that You as parents are saying, you know what? We're going to bring our children to the house of the Lord, but we're going to give them back to God. And God, here's the thing, and this is what I want you to hear. No matter what's going on in society, no matter how crazy the world's becoming, it's not going to touch my children. They are going to be preserved. They're going to be protected. And so I want you to do this. I want you to answer this question. Before Almighty God, He's listening. Do you promise to raise your child or your children in the fear and the admonition of Almighty God? I promise. Promise? All right. With that, Pastor Brenda, I want you to come and join me. We're going to come, and, and the scripture is very clear. You know, you don't find infant baptism, but what you do find is Jesus at eight years of age being brought to the temple in Luke chapter 2 to be presented to God. And that's what you're doing. Joseph and Mary were saying, Lord, we're giving Jesus back to you, Father, for what you want to do in his life. And then you also see a time when the children were being brought to Jesus. This is so powerful. This is what I like to do this. And they brought the children to Jesus and the disciples or some people in the audience said, hey, 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 push the children away. And Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. You know what the Bible said Jesus did? He put his hands of blessing and anointing upon those children. Think about it. What happens when God touches your child? And so when we come down after a short prayer, we're just going to lay our hands upon your child. And we believe that there is an anointing of protection and preservation, health and wholeness upon him. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, you call yourself the good father. The fact that you're a father lets us know how much you love children. Father, you see the things that are going on in the earth, especially regarding children. Jesus was so serious about it. He said, let a millstone be tied around their neck and cause one of these little ones to stumble or be harmed. And so, Lord, today you see every child, you see the children that are being dedicated. You heard what the parents and the guardians said, and that is that, Lord, they promise to raise this child or these children to fear you, to honor you, to love you. I pray, Lord, as Brenda and I come down and we place our hands upon every child, that you would release, Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, an anointing of preservation that will protect these children from harm, from evil, from disease and sickness. And Lord, every child shall live a full age. And every child, the very thing that you recorded in the books of heaven concerning them, what your will is concerning them, Lord, will be fulfilled. I pray that every child would serve you all the days of their life and that they would love righteousness and every child would hate iniquity. I pray that you would give the parents wisdom to speak words of wisdom. 
and knowledge and life, protection, instruction to their child, that the children will walk in the way of the Lord. And even as they're old, they'll not depart from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's going to be our honor if we can. Don't worry if they fuss or whatever. Listen, Matthew still fusses and he's 28. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I had to say that. Oh, Lord, we release that anointing. Oh, hello. We will. How about we do it that way? Lord, we release that anointing of protection. Lord, we give her back to you for your glory and for your honor. <laughs> and Lord, we thank you that no harm and no evil cannot and will not come near them. Thank you, Lord. Wow. I just see a, a height that you're going to hit. You're going to hit a growth spurt. That's going to be shocking. But it's the height of who you are as a person that people are going to start to take notice of such a leader. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we lay our hands upon them. We release that anointing. We release that grace. And I thank you, Lord, that you protect them and preserve them. Keep them. Keep dancing. That's what I hear in my heart. Keep dancing because you're breaking things that the enemy would desire over your family and you're setting freedom. Freedom. Freedom has come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Such a voice. And that voice will be heard so loud. Thank you, Lord. Very determined one, but it will be because of the call of God. Lord, thank you for all of these beautiful children. We release that anointing upon them. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your hand of power and blessing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just hear you making incredible singing and songs before the Lord and to the Lord. And there's something very special of a creativity and, an, and even an artistic way about you that's going to start flourishing. And Lord, I just thank you for that. Such a strong, strong little leader. Almost independent, but that's okay. Thank you, Lord, for a strength. Oh, there will be such a strength and a might on this one. Not just in the physical, but Lord, in the spirit realm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for such a sweet, gentle way. Thank you, Lord. This one is so full of love. You watch. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for these children right here. <laughs> They're like, hey, dude. Father, we release that anointing upon them all in the name of Yeshua. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. There's going to be a grace not only upon this one, but a grace to raise them. And even a grace when you minister to this one, that's going to unlock some things that the enemy's tried to do to you. Because you are a good person. And this one is going to help pull that grace even out of you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you. I was almost going to bless you. I'll be blessed. <laughs> Take it. Lord, we thank you for these little ones. How old? Ten days. Ten days. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Brenda. Brenda. We'll His let you, we'll let you borrow him. For, yeah. for one week? <laughs> Look at it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, Lord. It's a little one. If people would just look at that little guy, how would they ever harm him in the womb? Oh, they're so precious. Thank you, Lord. There's a twofold blessing on this one. A heart like David. I hear music. But a heart for God. This one will run with God very strong. But will have the spirit of a Joshua. This one will be a leader and even at times a confronter. But will balance him will be his heart like a David. And his worship to God. Thank you Lord. Thank you Lord. This one will be apt to teach. Always want to show things, instruct, teach. Look what I've done. And they show pictures because there's even a, a teaching way, but a dramatic way that is going to really, really unfold. 
out of this one. And there's a gift, the Lord said, within their hands. Not only to write and to teach, but to heal. Physical healing, I'm serious. And you're going to see it even at a young age. Thank you, Lord. All right. I want everyone just to stand for just a moment. Thank you, Lord, for every child. <laughs> God, we give them back into your hands for your glory. Every single child. You better watch that little preacher. I'm telling you. Okay? I'm serious. He's going to have the determined twos. And not, not terrible. I'm talking about determined because there's a, there's, a, there's a way that's going to come out of him at a very young age that is going to be very, very shaping of his character. So just pay attention to that. Very determined, but it's part of the calling of God on his life. Amen. Well, thank you for the honor of being able to dedicate your children back to God. And uh, did I miss any of them? All right, let's give them a hand clap as they go back to their, to their seats. Amen. All right. That's always so great. And they're so cute. All right. You know, when I see a family of, of six like this, we grew up, you can go ahead and see, we grew up with nine in our family, seven kids. Mom, Dad, I don't know how you fed us. So I do know how my mom fed us. She would take this big old pot that she had. I don't know if she still owns it. And she would just set it right down in the middle of us all with one big old ladle. Is that what they call it, Mom? And who knows what was inside that? She ground up sticks, get some mud, and put some hot dogs in it and call it food. But we all turned out good, right, Mom? But she would make this. Can I say this, Mom? Because you would never make this again. But, but there's this one stuff that she would make. Can I say this, Mom? You know where I'm, go you know where I'm going, right? You can leave. No, don't leave because I'm going to preach. But there's this one meal that she would make, and I don't know if you guys like it or not. Mom, can I talk about this? This was, this was the good old days, right? No, I love rice a -roni. But here's the thing. It was the one where you put bread. So my mom would put bread in this big old pot with cooked tomatoes. And it literally smelled like vomit. And, and my dad's rule was you had to eat everything on your plate, and I would be sitting here gagging. You remember that? food mom I don't know what that was but anyway that's I'm just glad I don't have to eat that stuff I'm glad Brendan never brought that stuff into my house but you know I'm teasing you right mama she's laughing I don't want to embarrass her because she's a good cook all right I want you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 24 and uh, my mom knows me well enough that I'm not making fun of her her cooking she knows she knows I didn't like that even when I was a kid I still protest it what's it called stewed tomatoes or something how many ever had that meal how many of you like it? No. Oh, I hear some people that have had it. See, Mom, we're not the only kid. <laughs> and, and you turned out great. See, you know, there you go. All right, hey, I want to just mention a couple things real quick. I'm going to not preach to you very long. Um, don't forget uh, that Wednesday night we're going to have a Prophetic Pulse conference call. And there are a lot of prophetic words that are coming to pass. The prophetic team, Anthony, you all did a great job of putting together, researching prophecies, headlines. It's amazing. So we're going to talk about what does all of this mean. So join us live right here. Also, those of you that are watching online for Wednesday Night Prophetic Pulse. But what I did notice is last Wednesday, you all had a prayer meeting, and Brenda had it going on in our house. And uh, all of you... Uh, that came. Thank you so much. There was the spirit of prayer here. Uh, also, those that came to, up to pray and led prayer, you did an amazing job. And uh, I felt like the Lord said, through the summer months, until he tells us otherwise, let's kind of bring Wednesdays back to praying uh, for each other, for our lives, for this nation, for the midterm elections. Um, you know, just many things. Signs, wonders, miracles. So I want you to join us on Wednesdays uh, going forward for a time of prayer, and also we will be streaming that. And then Tuesday we'll be back on um, Flashpoint because of, um, you know, I, have, I was on vacation, but we're going to be back on with Lance and Mario and, of course, Pastor Gene. So looking forward to that, and don't forget to join us in Atlanta uh, for Flashpoint Live. All right, I want to preach to you today about Pentecost. And uh, how many of you would call yourself you know, not that you're trying to get caught up in titles or whatever, but you are a charismatic or you are a Pentecostal. Okay. And uh, how many of you, you were never 
uh, really, you didn't grow up a Pentecostal or a charismatic, raise your hand, okay? How many of you don't really know what I'm talking about? It's okay. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get you there. Here's the thing. So I want to read something uh, out of Scripture because God is very serious about His promise, and the promise was the Holy Spirit that would come on the day of Pentecost. Look at Luke chapter 24. Pastor Brenda read it at the offering. And it says in verse 49, he says, Behold, or you could say, Look, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And then he says, But tarry or shut yourselves in. It's one thing if God shuts you in, it's another thing if the government tries to do it. There's a difference, right? You can shut yourself in with God and experience liberty and freedom. You get the government to shut you in, they take your freedom away. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but wait or tarry, shut yourselves in, in the city of Jerusalem until why? You be endued with power from on high. All right, let's follow it up. Look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Why were they supposed to tarry in the city of Jerusalem? Now, people will take this scripture, and sometimes what they say is, well, I haven't received the Holy Spirit. I'm still waiting. I'm still tarrying. And they make this as the basis of their argument that they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They have to wait for the Holy Spirit. And you've got to understand something. If you're going to take this as your basis of your scripture that you haven't received the Holy Spirit because you have to wait, then you need to fulfill all of it. You need to go to the city of Jerusalem. All kidding aside. No, he was telling them that they had to go and wait in the city of Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. Why? What were they receiving and why was God making them wait? Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but you shall receive power. Someone say power. power. Notice what you receive. Power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in Omaha or whatever city that you're watching from and in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and everywhere in the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've had people say, well, uh, tongues of the other devil. Uh, speaking in tongues passed away, but I want to say, whoa, 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 whoa. And then they will talk out of their mouth that they support missions. You ever heard that? Well, we support mission. We're a mission driving church, but we don't believe in speaking in tongues. We think it's of the devil. Wait a minute. Do you know that he did not pour out the Holy Spirit? Or, or let me say this. He did not commission them in the Great Commission until the Holy Spirit was poured out. He realized that when he said, go and make disciples, the thing that they would need the most would be the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. And then he said, listen, you're going to receive this power, but wait, wait before you go on the mission field. Wait before you make disciples of all nations until you get the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues. Amen. That's the Great Commission. The Great Commission is great because you have power. Amen. You can face down every witch doctor, every warlock. Come on. You can, you can go to a foreign land and demonstrate the power of God. Amen. Not that you can just build a well, even though I believe in all that. It's not just humanitarian efforts of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is cast out devils, heal the sick, preach the gospel, the good news, and demonstrate it in power. I remember I got saved in 1984. I know that was a long time ago. And I, I had just graduated out of high school in 1984. And um, I got saved in the summer, actually June of 1984. And uh, I guess I was their evangelism target. That's what they told me is that that was the one that they were praying for and going after. I don't know why. But I got saved in June of 1984. And I remember going to the church service and they gave an altar call and uh, I didn't go up at that time. I thought, you know what, I will just wait. And I went and I knelt down in the basement of my parents' home that I was living, with, living in. And I said, Jesus, I've heard about you. I want to know you. And I believe that you're real and I ask you to come into my heart and to forgive my sins. And so they told me to come back to the service. So I came back and they said, well, you need to come back next week. Because when you come back next week... 
You're going to get baptized. I said, well, I've already been baptized. They said, no, we're not talking about water. We're talking about you are going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I remember the woman that had sought me out. She was a uh, a little grandma looking lady. She had white hair and really piercing eyes. And her name was Germaine Saucier. And she became my spiritual mother. She lived to be 100 years of age. I was, in fact, her first spiritual disciple uh, in, in, in uh, her ministry. And uh, we became very close. She called me uh, her son. And I would go to her house uh, three to five times a week. And uh, she taught me how to read my Bible, to understand my Bible. She taught me the Word. And she also taught me how to pray in the Holy Ghost. And we would sit literally in her home, this little lady in her 70s probably at the time. And we would, you know, hold hands. And, I, and she would make me literally kneel down in her cou- by her couch. And we'd pray in the Holy Ghost. And she'd kneel. And if I'd start drifting off, she'd smack me on the back of the head and say, Keep praying! Oh! And I'd keep praying. <laughs> and if I would show up a minute late. I remember one time I showed up like a, I don't know, five minutes late. And I knocked on her door and I said, Jermaine, this is Hank. She said, you're five minutes late. I said, yeah, I know. Traffic was kind of heavy. She said, see you next week. I said, Jermaine, I I came here. She said, I don't play. And if you want to be what God wants to make you because you are called to the whole earth to preach and to be a voice, don't you play either. And I learned something from her. I learned the power of the Holy Ghost, but I learned extreme discipline. And I learned something. And so I came back that that night, and I didn't even know what in the world I was going to receive. And uh, the service was done, and Jermaine walked up to me, and she said, listen to me. And she started prophesying over my life and, and what I'm walking in today. And I was so scared. I was a shy kid. Mom can tell you, I was very shy. And But I loved people. And so I came back, and all I remember is after the service, she said, you ready to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. She said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, a river, not one, two words, which is okay if that's what some people's experience are. Rivers, rivers, rivers just kept flowing out of me. I couldn't shut it off. I tried to talk in English. I couldn't talk in English. I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to explain this to my parents? I remember pulling up in my driveway. I got out of my car. I said, I am not going upstairs. My mom and dad were watching TV. I think I waved at them. I went downstairs, laid on my bed. It was about 9 o'clock at night. I couldn't shut it off. Tongues. I kept praying in tongues. I remember waking up at 2 o'clock was the last time that I looked at the clock and I had still been praying in tongues in the morning. And so I shut my eyes at 2 o'clock in the morning and I was taken up to heaven. This was in 1984. And uh, I was taken before the throne of God and there was brilliant light. There was a crystal glass sea in front of me and there was multitudes of people. Man, I still see it, Lord. And there were people that were worshiping and I never heard worship like this in all of my life. I never heard the sounds like rushing water and sounds. And all of a sudden out of the brilliant light came a hand and I knew it was the hand of God and it touched me. And I remember he was commissioning me and assigning me to something in the earth to speak to the tongues he said and tribes of many nations. And he touched me. And when when he touched touched me. I began, I kept praying in tongues. And, and what woke me up was my mom was at the top of the stairs. She had no idea that I'd been praying in tongues all night and had been caught up and had this experience. It changed my life. This, my friends, is the power of Pentecost. It is life changing. Now, I believe that that's not just something that we read about in Scripture or this is just, you know, my story. I believe that there is coming a revisitation of the Spirit of God once again upon America, upon His people, upon the church. Come on. I believe that there is a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit, a fresh outpouring of God. Now, here's the thing. I asked God a question. In fact, I wrote a book. It's actually coming out in just a few months. Uh, it's, it's called The Supernatural Power of the Blood of Jesus. And I asked God a question. I said, Lord, why? Why does the devil attack speaking in tongues so much? And, and the Lord, you know, he, you know, where preachers get up and they say it's of the devil. Yet the Bible says when they were speaking in tongues, they were magnifying God. And I said, Lord, why? What is the big deal? And of course, there's many reasons why the enemy fears you praying in tongues. 
You know, I remember when we got married in 1989, Brenda and I, we were, uh, she came to work as uh, in the accounting department at the church uh, that we were serving in Bellevue Christian Center down in Bellevue back in 1988 is when you started working there. And, and I thought, man, this girl is amazing. And so I had to play it cool. And so I thought, well, I'll just become our prayer partner. And so for the longest time, we just went out and read the Bible together and prayed. And finally, one day she said, uh, are you ever going to ask me out? See, men, just play it cool. It'll come around in, in the end. <laughs> just play it easy. Dude. And so I said, well, I, ha I have been asking you out. She goes, no, I mean like a date. And so we went on a date. And I think, I think we went on a date. We went on a date, honey. We're kind of boring people. But anyway, we went on a date. But Brynn and I, we didn't even know each other. And we would be holding hands. And I could feel power when I was praying with this woman. And when she would open her mouth, I would feel authority. Well, that continued in our marriage. I mean, in 1989, when we got married, July 22nd, 1989, Brenda and I, we were trying to birth our ministry and, we, and nothing seemed to be working. Nothing seemed to be happening, but we would join hands for hours, two to four to six, even eight hours, pacing our little apartment, praying in tongues and not stopping. You know, people say, well, I'm having problems in my marriage. Well, if you're both Christians, you shouldn't. Well, pastor, you mean you never argued? Oh, no, we, we are. We are strong-willed. Of course we argue. And Brenda always wins. But no, seriously, we argue. Of course we argue. But here's what, here's what keeps us. Jude verse 20 says, when you pray in tongues... You build yourself up in your most holy faith, keeping yourselves in the love of God. I hear people on social media, I'm so scared, I'm afraid, don't you know the world is falling apart? And I thought, you know, do you ever pray in tongues? I literally want to type in there, do you pray in tongues? You know, some people talk in all caps. Why do people have to type in all caps? I mean, you got it stuck on cap lock or what? It's not like you're shouting at me. Take it off cap lock. That's what I, Brenda won't let me be the administrator for the social media because I'd say stuff like, shut up. You an idiot. You ignorant. You ain't nothing. You don't know nothing. I pity the fool that wrote that comment. <laughs> That's what I, I'd be the Mr. T of social media. <laughs> anyway, so... Are you all here? I'm trying to get done here. Okay, so, so I, I read people's comments, and I'm like, Brenda, I want to comment. And here's what I want to comment in the voice of Mr. T. I pity you. You pray in tongues, fool. Because if you prayed in tongues, you wouldn't be writing what you're writing. It says when you pray in tongues, you build yourself up in your most holy faith. So there's something to be said. So when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, it changed my life. When I prayed with my wife, it changed my life. Now let's look at what happened on Pentecost and let's pull it into what defines Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now I asked God a question one day. I said, Lord, why was it a rushing mighty wind? Of your spirit. You know what he said? He said, I couldn't wait to fill my people. He said, I was God in the box. Remember, God used to have to walk around as in the Ark of the Covenant. He couldn't wait to be in the true temple. You. And so he came to express that. That's why I don't ever think that you're not worth anything. God himself lives inside of you. He rushed so that he could live and move and have his being on the inside of you. And notice it would fill all the house where they were sitting. Now, I want to ask you a question, charismatics, Pentecostals. What's your house filled with? Filled with fake news? Filled with a bunch of lies coming from the media? Or is your house filled with the Holy Ghost? Is your house filled? Is it a spirit-filled house where people walk in your house and, and, and they feel God? You know, I have people that come over to my house and say, man, I don't want to leave. I'm like, well, you need to leave. And they say, I feel God here. God's in my home. Is God in your home? Hmm? Got to ask yourself that question. So it filled the house where they were sitting. Now watch. 
Let's answer this question. Why does the devil hate speaking in tongues? You can find one of the most important answers to that right here in verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Notice fire. Why would God have to show a visible display of cloven tongues of fire that sat upon each of them? You ever thought about that? It's the very answer to why the enemy attacks speaking in tongues so much. He hates what tongues represent. It attests attest to something. It testifies. It witnesses of something. You know what it is? How many of you know your Bible? How many think you know your Bible? Those of you that are watching. Whenever there would be an animal sacrifice that was a bullock or a lamb that was presented the blood was shed and it was presented to God in a sacrifice or in prayer or worship. How did the people know that God approved of that blood? He would send fire. So you know why the devil hates Pentecost? You know why the devil hates when you speak in tongues and you magnify God? You are adding your agreement and your witness when you pray in tongues to something by God sending fire, he was saying, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, his blood is worthy. He is the last and final sacrifice. And just like I did when others would offer the blood of an animal or a lamb, I offered the blood of the Lamb of God and I approve. And boom, fire fell. And not only that, but he, how does it say this? Out of the mouth of how many? Two or three? Witnesses, let every word be established. And every time you pray in tongues, you are adding your agreement to the holy blood of Jesus. That's why I don't let some dipstick preacher tell you it's passed away. It's for some and not for you. Well, that's not what happened on Pentecost. And they were all filled. All 120. Didn't skip over. Bartholomew, I'm sorry. Your name's too long and you can't have the Holy Spirit. Timothy, you are so full of unbelief. You don't, or not Timothy, uh, what's this? Doubting, not Timothy, doubting Thomas. I knew it started with a T. Doubting Thomas, you are so full of unbelief. I'm sorry. You are absolutely not going to get the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them, Amen. including women, who later became deaconesses in the church. And the first person that Jesus commissioned to preach the gospel was a woman. He said, Mary, go run. Go tell. I'm commissioning you to preach this gospel. Tell them I'm alive. Tell them the good news. Because he knew that women talk more than men. And he knew that they couldn't keep a secret. Amen. They're bound to tell. And so he commissioned the woman got not only the women, but here's the thing. Do you know who was part of the 120 that got filled with the Holy Spirit with this all? Jesus' mama. It says Mary was part of the 120. She spoke in tongues too. Isn't that amazing? She spoke in tongues. So men and women spoke in tongues. They all did. Not anybody got left out. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit. God did the, gave them the words. Their job was to speak it out. And there were Watch this. Dwelling at Jerusalem, devout men out of every nation. Now, how many of you know there was a crowd? Did they hold back like some user-friendly churches? Oh, we don't want to make anyone nervous. We don't want to, we don't, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of people, so we don't want to scare people away. Well, that's not what God thought. God waited till they had an audience. And he literally poured out the Holy Spirit, yeah, to even where some in the crowd thought they were all crazy. But they didn't stop God from pouring out His Spirit. And preacher, it shouldn't stop you either. Amen. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded because they heard every man heard. Yeah, they heard speak in their own language. That was supernatural. It wasn't that these men knew the language. These men were speaking in unknown tongues or languages supernaturally. That they just happened. That's what makes it even more incredibly supernatural. I remember when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I said this in the first service. I was walking into a restaurant, and these two guys come out, and they're speaking some, some language that was foreign. I didn't understand what it was. 
And uh, so I thought, hey, man, I'm going to try to do what was on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to try to see if they understand what I'm saying. So I spoke something out in tongues, and they looked at each other, and they went, I don't know. I'm not going to say how they sounded, but I'll just make some up. Ooga, booga, ooga, 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 ooga. And I just kind of was like, okay, okay, man, I guess that's the wrong tongue. But, but here, here's the thing. This day it worked. And they heard them speak in their own language. That in itself was supernatural. They were amazed that they heard them speak in their own language. Now let's talk for a minute. What defines Pentecost? What is it that we need again? First of all, this church, you could say the 120 was the birthing of the church. Birthing of the ecclesia. Ecclesia, however you pronounce it. You pronounce it different. Ecclesia, there you go. I knew how to say it. I just wanted to make sure you all knew how to say it as well. <laughs> Sometimes I, can, I know words and then I get up here and it's like, I don't remember. But that's all right. It's all good. And don't correct me on social media because then I will be the administrator. And, and I'll let you have it. So don't, 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 don't do that. I have a button. It ain't fully under the blood yet. And if you push it, I will respond just so you know. Now, here's the thing. So where are we at? What are we talking about? So the church was born in power, but also notice what defined it, the presence of God. I would go to a church where it's as dead, as dead, as dead, as dead. In fact, it even took the angels when they came in the book of Matthew. They're, you know, they're all coming down to look for Jesus' body, and they go right inside of the tomb, and the angels are sitting there. And you know what they said? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? I mean, that's still what angels are saying to some folk who attend their church. They see you drive up to that dead church, and the angels like looking at each other like, Guido. Yeah, Spike. Why are they going looking for the living among that dead church? And I don't know, but I guess we got to go in there and be part of that dead service. And then they put a petition in, Lord, we want to go to a live church. That's where some people are. Just holding on for revival, holding on that it changes. And they keep going to the same old dead, dry, boring church where God's presence isn't. They're looking for the living among the dead. Joshua 3, you know what they did when the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God showed up? The instruction was, Joshua, when you see the presence of God, you tell the people to remove their foot from where they're at And go after the presence of God. If there's ever a word, especially churches that still haven't opened up, or they delayed it for so long, or they require you to have a vaccination card, or to wear a mask, uh, take your foot and remove it and go find where the presence of God is. And if you can't find one, join it online. So here's what defined Pentecost. Look here, Acts 2.14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Now, this was a coward. This man denied Jesus three times. He was afraid to be confronted. He was afraid to confront. He was afraid of what would happen to him. Now, all of a sudden, he received this supernatural power that Jesus promised. And he's lifting up his voice with his first sermon And he said unto them, you men of Judea, and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, listen to my words. Now, that is a bold man. When he's telling the congregation that's mocking some of them, hey, listen to me, listen to my words. Well, who do you think you are? I said, listen to my words. That's boldness. You know what I've noticed? People are either bold Or they play the avoidance game. We're just going to avoid it. We're not going to talk about the culture. We're not going to talk about how messed up all this redefinition and redefining of words are. We're going to go ahead and let them have, you know, their gay pride. But we won't show any pride of being straight. Okay, we won't show the pride of that's worked for thousands of years. A, A marriage between one man and one woman. And the good part is you get to make babies. The biblical way, the moral way. I mean, we're sitting there letting them take a whole month 
infiltrate our, our TV shows and everything with their gay pride. I'm not against a gay person. I love a gay person in the love of Jesus. But I love them enough to tell them the truth. Speak the truth in love. I love them enough to show them that the scripture commands us all to repent. I love them enough to say that's not the way that God ordained marriage. I have enough holy pride, not arrogance, to tell them the truth. How come straight people aren't saying, hey, we need to have a straight month. Why not get this in the courts? Why not celebrate traditional marriage? Why not celebrate this is a man month? I'm going to identify in America. I'm going to show you what a real man is. And I don't even have to undress to prove it. See, we're so silent. We never lift up our voice for anything. We let everybody else lift up their voice and become the voice of insanity to our nation and exploit our children and continue to push their perversion in our schools, upon our televisions, in our pulpits, God forbid. I watched, and now listen, I'm sorry. This may offend you. Again, I, I may not see you next week, you know, because, you know, they might make me lose my job here, right? But you know how suggestions come up. I, I'm not even hardly on social media. But I saw a suggestion come up Pentecost Sunday from a church that was advertising. And they, I don't know where this church was. And, and the guy gets on, and, and I click it on, and he's advertising, come enjoy Pentecost with us. And he gets on, and the first thing he says is, and he goes, hi, my wife and I, we want to invite you to enjoy Pentecost Sunday with us. And we are going to splash in the Spirit's presence together. And I want to mention Pentecost is a very powerful moment where we are going to come together. We've got some coffee and donuts, and we're just going to celebrate together. Huh? Now, I'm not making it fun of the way you talk, but I am listening to what you say and how you're talking, and I don't feel any authority on you, sir. And I don't feel like you are really understanding Pentecost. It ain't about coming together to splash and have fun. It's about the power of the Holy Ghost. Revisiting his people again. And I thought to myself, I'm not faulting the transgender, the guy who who dresses up. He's a dude, but he dresses up like a woman and wants us to play, you know, make believe with him. I play and make believe with you. Dude, you can dress up all day long. You can change your body parts and make it look like a woman. You can say you're a woman. I ain't playing make-believe. And the reason why some of these people are gender confused is because we got preachers behind our pulpits that don't have the authority and the power of God upon their lips. They came into the culture... They have to make everything so nice. Do you know nice, again, is not a fruit of the Spirit. Nice is I'm going to be a chameleon. I'm going to conform to whatever is in front of me because I don't want to make anybody mad. So i got to be nice. No, loving kindness is you recognize there might be a homosexual and your loving kindness is, hey, I want to love you as a person. As a person, I want to love you, and I do. But I want to show you a better way. Just like I would a liar. I love you as a person, you lie ball, you. But I want to show you a better way. You don't have to lie. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's really what our, I don't know why we're preaching this stuff anyway. It's Pentecost. So he lifted up his voice with boldness. Now watch this. I I want you to look at this again in Acts 2.14 as they come to the piano. But Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice. So if he lifted up his voice, what does that mean? What does it mean about Pentecost? It means that the voice or the volume level actually increased with the spirit-filled presence. How many of you grew up in in a dead church? How many have ever been to a dead church? 
Someone said, yeah, I was here last week. No, I'm teasing. No, 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 no. We, he wasn't dead last week. He ain't dead. But, but here's the thing. I grew up, man, and, and, and I, I, I remember growing up, sometimes I'd go to, you know, a denominational church, and they'd be the organ player, and, and, and I would be so scared with the don, 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 waiting for the preacher to come out and go, hello, I'm Pastor Hitchcock. And tonight we're going to talk about birds. And we're going to study about birds. Man, I was all creeped out, you know, waiting for something to come out of the crypt that they bury un underneath, you know, like this, you know, as they're playing the organ. It scared me. Then I got into the other kind of church, and, and, and I'd get in there, and it'd be like they're telling me what to do. Stand up. Sit down. Kneel. Stand up. Sit down. Kneel. But don't you dare say anything. In those kind of churches, you couldn't say, man, they throw you out. Usually after the offering. <laughs> and then there'd be just enough where you are participating in the service where they tell you to stand up, sit down, but shut up. But if they prayed a prayer, you all had to agree with the prayer. And you had to say something like this, Lord. And there was so much excitement when they would say it. Lord, hear our prayer, prayer, prayer. How many grew up like that? But a Pentecostal church, y'all think I'm interesting up here. I'm telling you the truth you know I am. But Pentecostal churches, that's why you hear people say when they preach, you know, preacher preaches something, you know, Jesus is coming. Hello or amen, right? Because there's a volume. There's an expression. Think about it. Pentecost was even about expression. They thought they were drunk. Peter said, man, these guys aren't drunk. But they thought they were drunk. But the volume, the volume. I've had people say, well, church is too noisy. Well, wait a minute. Do you go to a movie and tell them to turn the speakers down? No, you're like watching Star, was it Star Wars. Hey, man, turn that baby up. Got to hear all that. You're right? But get into church, turn it down, you know, and all of a sudden, instead of the spirit of God, you got the spirit of Elmer Fudd. Remember Elmer Fudd? <laughs> Shh, be very, very quiet. We don't want to offend the Holy Spirit here. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Pentecost, Peter lifted up his voice. It means the volume. And not only that, look here, look here. Not only did he lift up his voice, which means the volume was raised, but look at Acts 2.6. And when this was noised abroad, it was so noisy, they heard it outside of the church. Man, that's noisy. Yeah. Remember the first time I came into church and they're playing drums and, and electric guitars and I keep telling our guitar players, man, come on, man, just get on that wall and jump off of it or something, you know? Just, <laughs> you know, but I'm like, oh, man, they got instruments and, you know, the, the, the white man, Caucasian rhythm deficiency started kicking in, you know, they're playing the drums and guitar and I'm like, starting to feel it. I never did that before because you weren't allowed to move in the churches that I went to. Right? God's holy. You move. He's going to kill you. <laughs> right? You can look at the first service where I imitated, where I went to uh, different churches in my, my ministry years, and, and how, you know, you get among the spirit filled, and it, it's just the volume, the freedom. Now, some of that can be also manufactured. How many ever been to a, a, a Pentecostal charismatic church where it's, it, it's, it's not... It's just manufactured. You ever been to some of those too? Yeah, we all have been there. But, but that doesn't mean that the legit isn't legit. Right? Here's another thing. Look here about Pentecost. And we're going to close with one phrase. Pentecost also is not only noisy. The volume and expression was a part of it. But notice in Acts 2 verse 23. Look at, look at the preaching. I mean, people leave churches because the pastor preaches about righteousness. I've heard people say that before. Well, all they're talking about is righteousness. Righteous living. Okay, well, then, you know, what God loves about his son is he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. So we should all, it's not by works, but we should all, our hearts, man, God, we want to please you. Now watch this. Listen to his sermon. This is going to, this is going to cut you to your heart, man. And, and Peter stands up and says, but being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken. And by wicked hands 
you have crucified and slain. Now, do you think that that is a nice message? That is a confrontive message. Look at Acts 2, 36 to 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus. Notice, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. I think we need to have some Pentecostal preaching that's classy, but yet is telling the truth that literally it causes something to happen in the hearts of people, the culture even. That's why you just can't agree to be nice. No, you need to stand up and tell the truth in, in, in taste and in grace to people. And notice what it did. Not only were they pricked in their hearts, but they wanted to change. They said, what should we do? What are you wanting from us? What do we need to do to, to really accept what you're saying, this responsibility? I believe preaching today is so, you know, you can make it, which we need those kind of messages. But where are the messages where people are walking out of the church going, you know what? I want to go to a higher level in God. I want to be a radical Christian. I don't want to just blend in. I don't want to be a Christian at church and then go live like the devil in hell all through the week. If I'm dating my girl and I'm a Christian, I don't want to just, you know, live in sin throughout the week and then just act like, you know, we ain't sleeping together when we get to church. Come on, man, that's hypocrisy. You ought to start getting married. Do it right. But quit doing it until you get married. Otherwise, you don't feel right when you're in church. All right, are you hearing me? You got to get it right. But see, that kind of preaching will change. You know what I loved growing up in the Assemblies of God? Back in 1989. In 84, they'd always tell you, man, every week you repented. Remember that? Yeah. I love Jeannie Mayo, but every week she called for an altar call and everybody repented. And it kept me as a 19, 20 year old kid living right. And then the big thing was, is you better get it right because you don't know any day Jesus might come. And then they'd show you those movies where uh, you could be left behind. Remember that? Yeah. And the little razor going on the sink, and you're thinking, oh, my God. And they play that song. Two men were working, one were taken, the other one was left behind. Don't you be left behind. Y'all recognize that song? Huh? Was that not it? Brenda said it wasn't anything like that, so no wonder you didn't recognize that song. There's nothing like that, nothing like that. But... It scared me. I was like, man, I don't want to be left behind. Now I, I'm for a new movie about the end times. I, I want to call it Kick Him in the Behind. <laughs> All right, never mind. Let's just go on. Let's go on. Let's go on. <laughs> I want to show you one last thing. All right. So I, I saw this phrase, and I'll end with this. I saw this phrase, and it just stood out to me. And this is why I feel so compelled to do prayer kind of through the summer here. Go to Acts chapter 2 in closing, verse 4. And this really hit me. I don't know why. It just, it's like I couldn't get away from this. And um, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet so you know I'm done. And I want you to look at this verse and those of you that are watching. I haven't been here for two weeks. I haven't preached for 30 days. So thank you for giving me a little extra time. And I saw this and it hit me. And they all, and they all began to speak in tongues. They all. And I asked myself a question. Here's my question that I asked myself that I want to ask you. What would be the state of this church if every single person who says, I'm a member of this church, prayed in tongues? What happens if we all prayed in tongues together through the summer? What would be the state of this church? What would be the state of the Lord's church in America if everybody would just begin to pray in tongues rather than always be so quick to comment? What would be the state of the believer? What would be the state of you if we all just started praying in tongues? You know why I know people aren't praying in tongues? Because it said, as I mentioned earlier, when you pray in tongues according to the book of Jude, you build yourself up in your most holy faith. There's something that happens in your spirit, your faith, that you're not moved by what you see and hear. People that are always constantly commenting, I'm afraid. 
Oh, Lord, when? I'm scared. Yeah, that might be how you truly feel. But you post it because you've gotten yourself so inundated with what's happening in the earth by what you see that you're, you're, you're adapting to it in the soul realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your own physical energy, that you're pulling yourself out of the spirit. The spirit is the strongest part of you. That's why Jesus, when he found him asleep in the garden of, of Gethsemane, he went to the lunkheads three times, said, why are you sleeping? The spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Well, if your spirit is willing, then give it what it wants. It wants connection in the spirit with the word of God, but also praying in tongues. What would happen? What would be the state of the nation? What would be the state of social media if people raised up their level of praying in tongues. We wouldn't see so much solical stuff. In fact, I believe if people would just begin to pray in tongues, it would change the state of the church, the believer, the nation. It would literally change social media from a platform of solical media to spirit-filled media. It would limit fear. It would deal with complaining and expose it. It would literally uh, gag the spirit of unbelief. It would absolutely, I believe, exhaust the spirit of arguing and strife. It would bring divine order to division and misbehavior that's happening among spirit-filled Christians. You know why I know that we're not on a rescue mission from God right now? It's because the level of the church is not where it needs to be spiritually. But what would happen... If we would all call Mama Sike, Resikite, Reba Senemika de Levusa Morokota. Come on, you start getting afraid, you start feeling afraid, you turn off the silly television set. I'm gonna turn you off, television set, click, and then you're gonna click something else off. So you literally go up to that television set, goodbye news, click. Kito Robobosa. I'm going to click that baby on. Kito Robosa. Mama Baraba Katea. And you start pacing your living room. Kuto Robobosa. I Parababa Sekea. I Taredede Katea. Torobosa Kayatea. Father, I cry out for America. Arabasso Korili Mikiete Dede. Father, the gas prices are getting higher. I pray in the Holy Ghost, Father, that you would begin to loose. The, the hold that these gas prices have, the fear, Lord. I pray that you would cause them to lower. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. How many believe something would change? I believe that we would see the spirit of cowardice go and be replaced by the spirit of boldness. I believe that we would see that they, even though they try to censor us, they can't silence us. We would affect spiritual atmospheres and cultures. We would affect politics. And we would restrain evil. So I'm going to challenge you. If all you do is pray uh, in English, I want to challenge you tomorrow. Start praying in tongues. If you pray in tongues five minutes, I want you to add at least ten more minutes. Let's start getting over praying in tongues. Meet me on Wednesday nights through the summer. Let's pray in tongues. Let's get, come on, let's shift the atmosphere. So we can see some things of sanity through our midterm elections. That it's not the midterm mess. The midterm confusion. But it's a midterm miracle. How many believe that? I believe we can do that. At this time, I just want to end the service, but I want the altar team to come up. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart to forgive your sins. I just want you to repeat after me, those of you that are watching, if you're in this room, just say, Heavenly Father, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe the Bible. And it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Jesus, I call upon you. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. And I promise I will serve you this day and all the days of my life. 
Now, maybe you're here and you are not one of those that can say, I speak in tongues. I pray in tongues. I want you to be bold. We need some bold people in this culture today. Okay, we don't need spiritual wimps. If Paul could go from a coward to a bold man, so can you. If I, a shy kid, could become bolder, so can you. So if there's anybody in here, you don't speak in tongues, you don't pray in tongues, maybe you've been prayed for before, maybe you've been prayed for 20 times, five times, or not at all, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, preacher, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, there's one hand. Great. I want you to do this. I want you to step out. I want you to come up here because we're going we're gonna to pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just be bold. Amen. I believe there's more people. Just kind of go along this wall right here. I feel this presence of the Lord. We're going to pray for you. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak in other tongues. Amen. Why don't we have this prayer team come down here and meet these as well. And uh, they're coming. If you don't uh, speak in tongues and you're watching, I want to encourage you in closing of this. All you need to do is just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. And I say right now, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just begin to open your mouth and let the Lord give you the utterance and your job is to speak it out and give it volume. That's all you need to do. Just speak it out. Come on, just pray in tongues with me, everybody. For just a second. Be filled with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name. All right. Altar team, go ahead and minister to these that have come up. I'm going to dismiss you, give somebody a high five around you. Let's give them an opportunity to pray for these people. So if you do want a fellowship, just kind of make it to the back and in the hallways of the Connect Center. Otherwise, I'll see you Tuesday night. I may be showing up tomorrow for the prayer. I think I might do that with the men and the women that are getting together. Otherwise, Tuesday night, Flashpoint Wednesday, we're going to hit it with prophetic pulse. All right, you're dismissed. God bless you. Thank you.